yummy.
Hi there, it's Pete, Mindwise Man's channel, aka Maverick Outdoors, and now this is a lovely sunny Saturday morning in the middle of April 2021. I'm on a work and leisure project, but obviously you'll see the leisurely side of me being out for these three days. And I'll give you a bit of an explanation as to why I pitched up here, why I needed to pitch up in this particular location compared to maybe where I'd previously planned to go of where I am so I've got the best vista sort of over 180 degrees and where the ridge line goes down to the broadside edges when I'm sitting I've still got the view even though being protected if the weather did get inclement but it's predicted it's forecast to be as it is as you can see now for the next 48 hours if you'd followed my travels right from the early days when I had my Savile Colorado and I was canoe camping from 2009 onwards, you'll notice these kit bags. And I just wanted a novel, I just fancied a bit of nostalgia really, instead of all the mod cons sort of um, deployment bags and what have you, I brought my 100 litre dry bag. So I say if you followed me from the early days, you will recognise that, a bit of nostalgia there. And my hunt fishing bag, kit bag. There's a fire space from when people have previously been here with launches and narrow boats and what have you and just scanning around to here and the reason i bought the two burner stove was that i might have been in a location whereby i might not have been able to get firewood or it might have been compromised or it just might not have been practical so i brought that really convenient i mean it saves such a lot of time but i think i'll have a leisurely fire pit later on for a bit of warmth and resonance for my pitch setup Another bit of nostalgic kit. I bought this, this little bag, I think it was £2.50 from the Bushcraft show. I think it was 2014 or 2015. And I got that to just use as a little, sort of out for the canoe, out in the canoe for a couple of hours just to put sort of odds and sods in it. But I've used it, when I did start to use it from the old days of the Savile Colorado, for my food bag. So I've got MREs in there. Um, you saw I had some fresh veg with an MRE meal last night. And that was put inside that rucksack with other sundries that that bag was used for. Normal space on the front left corner where I have my tools and my hardware and the leftover of my shelter kit and bits and pieces that I can actually go back into. On the south edge opposite side riverbank to me there's farmland and there's some machinery out. I think they're either ploughing or scarifying or doing something out there so now and then there's a little bit of sort of technical noise in the background but that's okay because it's obviously all part of the environment of being next to farmland but my previous location where I've been I mean I've been to this place uh, a few times before in the early days um, but I plan to go to my regular place uh, where I was in August last year when lockdown and restrictions had been lifted so I ventured out and also, again, that was partial work projects as well. So I'll kill two birds, one stone, have a bit of leisure at the same time and share the leisurely side as I am today in the next few days. Hence why I overloaded a little bit, took more than maybe I needed, but the extra contingency, the more bits and pieces that I would probably need. And in this case I did, so it was just, well, I did bring them in basher poles and also my sectional basher pole as well. But I'll, so, I'll show you around the setup in a little while as to the method, to the technique and how it was pitched and just utilising the space and just being in the best possible position without being too much of a wind trap because it is on this, this corner of the bank. So where I am now is exactly what I wanted on, on this side of the river bank. Uh, there's no boats moored up at all so I've got all this space to myself which is really nice it's going to get busy in the summer months uh, and I'd be lucky if I'd have actually got this spot unless I'd sort of set out during the week before the the weekend traffic starts a couple of canoe camp craft techniques and what have you that I've done before but they're sort of featured a little bit more relevant for this weekend due to the fact of you know what I planned contingencies in case uh, I couldn't get the first pitch that I was uh, planning to go to. So of course I've got plenty of water around. I've got my mill bank bag which I can filter the water, get rid of the sediment and then of course boil it up. Bit of a tangy flavour but it's still it's uh, not contaminated after that. That's last resort. But of course I brought my 10 litre water just for convenience just like the two stove cooker, two burner cooker. 
bit in the saucepan that I actually heated up the boil in the bag chocolate pudding. I've kept the water because I know the next day I still need that water to boil up all day breakfast MRE and I'm going to mix some biscuits browned with it. So I would have used that water. Less of it to rinse out where the residue was left after I've wiped it with some kitchen towel where there's a little bit of sticky residue to rinse out after heating up the water on the stove. Um, after using it to cook my dinner last night but then I wiped out the worst of the residue. Little technique wiped out the worst of the residue, you could hardly see it, but obviously it was still slightly skimmy there. Then put the water in it to boil up the um, chocolate pudding. And then after obviously I ate that, which you saw me do last night, it was really nice, especially with the custard. But what I started to do is actually break it up. It's normally a little block, and of course it heats up much quicker and effectively as well. But that aside, um, the water that's left over, saving that, and then that's gonna boil up the boil in the bag breakfast. So that's the method to the technique for that one. I didn't do any of my homemade brew portions, I just brought out the, the time that I had uh, I couldn't get my vacuum sealer out in time so I just thought what I'd do is I'll just bring a container of my full cream Milo powdered milk and then in this container I've got sugar on the base of it, tea bags and then a small little bag in there that's sealed up with a little clip fastener of actual instant coffee and a spoon. So that's my brew kit for this weekend. And I've got one of my usual bags that I use really heavy duty when things are uh, sent through the post. They might be packaged up and then put in those really sturdy black plastic bags. So I've got that from a rubbish bag, all hanging up nice and convenient. As you saw, I've got my comfy chair, fold up chair, but then also fold up stool. So that's easy for admin cooking and I can move it out of the way if I need to or use it. As you've seen me before, I've used that as a service to put things on. If I want to stay seated on the chair, which will stay here permanently. So I've got the vistas, the views, just the chill time. But then any activity around the kitchen space, I've got that stall to operate from. And none of this minimal kit malarkey. I've got the canoe. I knew where I had to portage if I had to, so there wasn't too much carrying of any kit. And it could all go in there. I've done it before when I haven't brought any bread or bread based side dishes or the toaster to go on top of the uh, burner or even a camping gas uh, little camping stove uh, so I use the biscuits brown break them up and put them in the open bag of the all-day breakfast so that replaces the bread or toast little technique I do making sure obviously clean surface clean hands is the biscuits I'm not going to use put them aside and then the ones that I am going to use crush them up, break them up and then just pour them into the MRE breakfast bag and you're ready to go. And then of course you put those back in what will then be an empty bag. You can use any sort of biscuits really, digestive biscuits if you want a bit of sweetness to them or crackers. But the thing about the biscuits brown, if you've had them before you know exactly what I'm talking about. They're really brittle, they're really hard. But when you actually break them up and then mix them and it goes in all the sort of juicy gravy of whatever dinner, food, breakfast, whatever you're going to mix it with that's got a sauce. It softens it slightly, but right in the middle it's still got a bit of crunch because of the consistency and density of these type of biscuit brown briskets. So, yeah, worth considering.
So like I was saying earlier, considering that I might have had to pitch up in an area where there was no uprights that I could actually fasten the tarp corners, ridge line, etc. to, um, this area here, obviously I had to then use the bits of equipment I brought with me. So the front end of the ridge line was paracorded to this little bit of bushy tree just here and then bungee corded just there. And I sometimes use a paddle to get some striation to lift it, otherwise the ridge line would have come too low. So that, as you can see, brings it up and creates a much better ridge line where it's slightly higher on the entrance end. And then the rear end speaks for itself. It's the sectional basher pole there, about six sections there, to take that up from vertical up to the top of the ridge line end. So two sticks, one at each rear end, I cut actually from a, believe it or not, a fallen deadwood part of willow tree and then some other ones, but there was some live stuff that was growing off the dead branch, which is obviously on its way out. So that's one there. And you can see easier, one on this left hand side. And you can see I've just whittled the top end so it fits in and doesn't slide down and then corded down to the ground and the same the other corner as well. Then returning to the front, front two corners, basher poles up to their highest point and of course that governed the height for the ones to be cut at the end. Okay this stick here is a utility stick that I cut with that saw and then use my old prototype jack law to whittle the top end of that stick as well. So that's used for either beating back nettles or self-defense. <laughs> which you can see facing out, so that would be to my left broadside, comes up a little bit, which just gives us that just a little bit more height, just to see outside. That was high enough anyway, but I thought well, I might as well use it, as I'm not actually using it to beat down any nettles or to break any wood. And the camo net in the point of that, now of course it's not super stealth. If there's anyone approaching from where I'm walking now, which is my most blind spot, but I brought it anyway, just in case I had to pitch up really low profile stealth in a really sort of sort of small restricted area where maybe I might have had to fasten the uh, tarp shelter, all the fixings down to the floor to the ground level. So it was literally an A shape. If that was the case and I was limited, uh, worst case scenario location where I was gonna pitch up. And the nature of the contingency allowing for that, bringing the camo net in so I got the space so I could carry it. And uh, that might have been more practical and useful if I'd have had to been a bit more stealth because of the location that I was going to have to pitch up. And from inside, it's far easier to see out through the camo netting than actually from the outside in at a distance. So if anyone was approaching through the thicket to the rear end of my setup, they're either not going to see me, less chance of seeing me obviously, until they got closer. If they didn't see me then it's not going to get their attention, that's the first thing. And then secondly, if they do move over this way, as a few people have done from over that direction, just afternoon or day paddlers that have moored up with their kids and have come to walk down this end. Uh, it was only a couple and then obviously seen me here and then reversed and gone the other way, obviously respecting sort of riverway code. Where it's polite and common courtesy not to invade someone's space unless you're invited. And as I say, it's not super stealth. If it was, it would be low profile. If it was, it wouldn't be set up like that. So it's my choice to have actually applied that camo netting because I had it. And then just that little bit of stalky brush, which was actually cut off from something that was actually, believe it or not, from a dying log. So, uh, you know, I just thought I'd utilise it. I'm not going to bush it all up and hide myself in like some real clandestine military mission. But once again, if you follow my travels, you'll know my philosophies behind sort of breaking up outlines or literal stealth camping or even just something like this, which is utilising what I've got anyway, so I might as well do it. Just one more thing, final thing, which I have included in the past, but obviously it's got relevance if there's any questions asked. The 3x3 tarp, if the weather kicked up really inclement, then I'd just lower the profile all the way down. I'd use the front two basher poles at that height for the ridge end. 
and then these four corners, this side and the other broad side, would be down at the ground. So it would literally be an A shape onto the ground. Very low profile if I need it. And of course, if that were the case, where I'm standing now, you would not be able to see the kit, which is visible now. So there's been a bit of traffic around here, paddleboarders, canoeists, kayakers, leisure boaters, what have you, but at least where I am located, there's no permanent fixings of people nearby, just people travel by, a few people that have stopped off near this river bank and, as I said, walk towards me, seeing I'm here and then just walked away. Another boat, little launch going by. So, um, yeah, there's sort of solitude that I wanted as far as where my pitch is, that was the main thing, not having been surrounded by loads of people. But it's really nice now, just chilling, surrounded by nature, river views. And it's coming up to four o'clock in the afternoon, so I think I fancy a brew, a cup of tea, so I'm gonna get the old kettle on the boil. Little bit of techno info regarding the one or two burner stoves of this nature. Obviously this is a dual fuel. We can either use the Coleman fuel or unleaded petrol. I use the unleaded petrol because it's about a fifth of the price. But when you prime it up, every time I've finished using it, this is the first sort of priming valve you only keep open for about the first minute, but that's it closed. Obviously that's the switch, but what I do is I pump what I'm going to do before I actually um, ignite it. I've not used it since breakfast, so I'm gonna prime this, pump it up, get a bit more pressure in here. Then when you ignite it, some of the pressure releases from the fuel tank, not, not dramatically, but enough for you then to prime it again about 15, 20 pumps while the flame is burning. Then you turn that back down, so that'll be on for the first part of it burning for the first minute, then you turn that off. And then obviously the valve is open and then it's ready to use. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna prime it up, while it's not ignited. I'm then going to ignite it. I'm then going to prime it again, about 15, 20 pressures. You can actually feel it. And then you can see the flame change as well. It goes from a bluey red, or even though it's, if it's all flipping about like a sort of bit of wet rag, then you know there's no pressure in here. But if the flames are sort of quite high, then they go down. You can tell the difference when you prime it, when you've ignited it for another 15, 20, you can see it gets more of a pressure build up. The flame goes down and it's more of an intense blue that's when you know you've got it at the right level to cook or heat with. Just when the river looks really still with hardly any current. That shows you how you can sometimes get caught out 
when you might be paddling upstream or even sometimes going for a little dip and with a lot of rivers that have quite a depth whether they're natural rivers or even cuts like canals the undercurrent sometimes anything from two to three foot below the top surface to about two to three foot underneath you can have a different sort of current altogether so again you can maybe go in for a swim I mean it doesn't look too bad but there's always that little thing that safety factor to look out for if you're tempted to go for a swim in the river is to be able to read the water because what might look rather calm on the surface can be more of an undercurrent swell not too far underneath so safety lecturing aside <laughs> let's have a look at my food bag my old classic what I'm going to have tonight is um, this microwavable bag tikka masala vegetable and I've also got November last year a chicken jalfrezi chickpea and rice so that's going to be a main portion of these things last if you store them properly these last can go well past the sell by date then other bits and bobs that I've got in here as you can see the MRE packs were sort of like lined in layers so just yet another way of food storage using this bag got other bits and bobs in here there's a custard for later on with a banana got sundries left over from a rat pack just like some chewing gum some tissue paper I've got a fruity juicy sort of syrupy fruit thing there and also I've got a I was either a choice between the curry or the Moroccan style bean stew with also um, long grain rice and in there somewhere lamb chickpea tagine so a Moroccan themed flavour but I think I'm going to have the, uh, the curry so I had the choice there and then for tomorrow I've got the vegetarian all day breakfast just a slightly different flavour obviously because it's not pork sausages it's more of a vegetarian base so it's a slightly different flavour but virtually the same content with the biscuits brown for tomorrow morning's breakfast here's one of my pre-made sachets which I've left over from last time which is a hot chocolate drink so it's hot chocolate and I think it's malty powder malt flavour drink um, in there as well sugar and then the full cream powdered milk, so it's a really rich, creamy, chocolatey, malty drink if I want that later on tonight. I actually brought this with me as well, this is out of a rat pack. Raisin sultanas, currants and mixed fruit. And I'll probably put some of these in with the curry, because obviously you can have fruit and that sort of thing in certain curries. So. Um, I'll let them really sort of hydrate with the juices and the gravy that's with the curry and I think I'll just add some of that with it as well just trying to be a bit creative, a bit different oh yeah and sometimes there's nuts that's added to some curries so that's some nuts left over from a snack I had when I'd set up my pitch I was a bit hungry before I actually had my late night dinner and there was some nuts and also some meat sticks but I nearly forgot I've been using dried coriander in a sort of spice bottle recently. It's sort of like chopped up leaves, a bit like what parsley would be like. And so I've got some coriander and there's just enough here to really add the type of flavour that I like to the actual curry themed dinner tonight. So I thought I'd just remember that and include that because I'm going to start using this much more regular when I'm out and about doing my outdoor stuff. So it's not going to be boiling the bag, it's going to be empty those sachets and heat them up in the saucepan and eat out of the saucepan, which is going to be more convenient and enjoy the view when I do have that scoff, yummy. If I could get my head in that pan, I would lick the inner surface. <laughs> that was blinking awesome, really nice flavour. Sort of, it, 
flavours that you'd expect if you know the taste of Gelfrezi or Ticker. But then mixing those two together and then just adding the dried fruit and the nuts and the coriander. It just had a really sort of expected curry tangy taste but it was just unique and individual flavour because of the nature of it as the ingredients and how it was concocted. So that was really nice. So unless I get starving hungry later on this evening I'll probably just have a snack but I'm not going to be using that to cook up again. Um, so as you can see I've just wiped the residue off and I'm just going to wipe it a little bit more. That doesn't have to be sparkly clean as long as it's just cleared surface because all that's going to do is boil up water tomorrow for the boil in the bag all day breakfast. Just going for a little walk along this river bank. See some of these old trees, the old white willow. Willow is very sort of springy wood. It tends to be very wiry and when it snaps it might be a bit springy then it will eventually fall. Similar to that. It will start to get very heavy and then start to buckle and then eventually split and snap. Probably won't be long until parts of that go. But as you can see there, that's where it's been a, like a springy wiry snap on that bit. And the waterway authorities that come along and maintain the river banks, you can see have been clearing all this lot up. There's another one over there. I can just about see the snap. Just that sort of apex. And there were probably some of these were probably on their way out. So they've come in and um, given them some welly and demolished them. So they can predict and make sure they're safe before they did any major mischief. I mean that branch coming over there, then going up there, it's got a lot of cantilever weight for it to eventually put pressure and eventually snap so it won't need much of a wind or force to eventually snap that and it'll probably go all of a sudden. And that goes for all trees really, but it's always about reading your terrain. So you get to know the type of trees. There's a whole mass of trees that have been cut out of the way. Some of these actually fallen in the water last year. And we're halfway across the river. So they've been cut and dragged in. So have a look at this lot. <laughs> so obviously they've all cut it. Cut it all down. Because this was the stuff that was hanging over into the river last year, last summer. I'm going into a little bit more of the riverbank woodland. And you can see this is just naturally fatigued over time and snapped and fallen. And if you were using any uprights that are around here, just within this vicinity, you know, sort of around this footprint area, and that fell on top of you, you'd soon know about it. And there's another one there. So as I say, it's always important to know your terrain, always looking up above anything that's not got any growth on it, or whether it's a tree that looks like it's got growth on it, but actually it's a dead one that's got intermingled with one that's growing around it with branches and sapling little shoots but of course something like that as well easily to access for firewood that's dead there's no life on that at all so always take dead wood never anything that's living more standing dead wood there as well with no buds or shoots coming off of it so that would be okay to use for firewood Interesting pattern at the base of that root, so it's obviously come out of the ground. That's a big old one there. I'd be surprised if some river dwellers eventually come up here with a chainsaw and cut some of that for their wood burners. So it's coming up to about 8.30 in the evening and uh, it's getting a little bit of a cool chill in the air. It's very mild, no breeze, but obviously no cloud cover today so it hasn't kept any of the warmth from the sun in. And the pressure's been high, 
so the temperature is not going to be that high, about the same as last night, about anything 2 to 3 degrees, something like that. Uh, but as the chill kicks in, probably in the next half hour when it gets a bit darker, I'll um, strike up the fire pit for a bit of ambient warmth and a bit of nice warm glow. I really like this through night head torch. It's just one single AA battery and I've featured it before but not for a long time but you press it and it flashes when it's at its lowest then you can see it getting brighter and brighter and brighter when it gets to its fullest beam it flashes so you can leave it like that but I'm going to press it so it goes right the way down to its lowest beam which is how I normally have it so at least the tension is drawn to you so I'd keep it like that but if you press it twice it goes on full beam straight away so I'm going to press it twice see full beam press it will go off press it again switch it on then press it twice while it's on full beam and I really like this lightweight it's just a single band that goes around horizontally around your head but it's lightweight can fit in your pocket and it's really served me well waterproof as well bit of light on the subject <laughs> Side Saturday night viewing. Best channel going. <laughs> warm, bright, and cozy viewing. And that warmth is really kicking off. And I can feel it. Nice and warm on my feet, up my legs, and I feel it against my face. So it's doing the job on this fresh, chilly night. But the sky is clear. And it's bright and starry. So I scraped some coals into the corner of the pit and put the kettle on top. So I'm going to boil some water, make a cup of tea, and push the mainstay of the fire over to the left. So it's just safe for me to procure the kettle to boil the water. I thought I might as well use it, it'd be a bit more tactile and rustic. Take a little bit longer than using the burner on the stove, but it's just part of using the fire and it being a bit more sort of primal. But it's really nice and warm. Back to the snacks. Army ration peanut butter sachet. Squeezed out and sandwiched in between a plain chocolate digestive and a rich tea. I had one in between two plain chocolate digestives and now uh, this is my second one. So that's a nice little snack. Peanut buttery with the biscuits. While savouring the fire rearing up again. Quality times outdoors. I'm sitting here now with my camo hood on, goes around my neck, insulates my neck and also my smock multi-pocket jacket. The NBC trousers with some thermal long johns underneath. It's the softy jacket and the softy trousers which obviously are done when I settle for the night and then the unzipped two season tropical army sleeping bag and that will do me for the night. I've got about 10 more pieces of firewood that are really thick about the size of your wrist forearm so I'll just wait until I've burnt all those and I'll settle for the night so probably for at least for another hour or so. But it's always the campfire that sort of mesmerizes you and creates that sort of primal link, especially when you're outdoors. 
and everything you've got is really reliant on what you've organised to bring with you and to utilise, and then maybe utilising things that are around you when you're setting up shelter. Obviously procuring firewood if you're doing like a feature of bushcrafting stuff or you might be doing bushcrafting skills. But then the campfire, that sort of sums it up. It sort of centralises that sense of identity that you have when you're outdoors. And also it's a great community spirit thing for people to sit around a fire space. And it just brings, normally it just brings everyone onto the same level. Very therapeutic. And on that note, I wish you well until tomorrow morning. Good morning, it's now Sunday and uh, lovely warm sunny morning. I really felt the warmth of the sun rising because obviously I'm sort of south facing here. Uh, lovely warmth on my back after a slight little chill factor. I was comfortable last night but just after waking I stirred, just sort of looked around, took a few breaths of fresh air and uh, very soon afterwards I heard a voice on the broadside of my basher saying good morning and instantly turned round and saw a gentleman with certain insignia on his jacket top saying um, you know what, I, what was I doing here and could see from my setup I knew what I was doing and myself knowing that this part of the river bank is public access it's been used for many years as a stop-off point along the river for canoeists, kayakers, sometimes narrowboat dwellers as well. But the custodians and wardens of this stretch of the riverbank have been getting more strict. They've had to, due to the fact of uh, people just not treating the area with respect. The usual thing, leaving their rubbish leaving scruffy fire pits, maybe not maintaining the area in the appropriate way. So over the past sort of five, ten years, I've noticed the difference of where river activities, which is great, you know, for health, fitness, well-being, all that sort of thing, and just general leisure, um, have become more popular, especially over the past five years, since big outdoors shops that sell camping kit, canoes, things like that. Um, have encouraged people to get out on the waters, which is brilliant. I've even noticed over the past five years how it's very much changed. There's more than twice as many people all sort of scuppering about, trying to get pitches maybe for overnight or just for the afternoon, having lunch on the riverbank, which was the main reason that he was doing his circuit, I suppose. Sunny weekend, just checking out maybe who's along these parts of the riverbank. Um, the custodians and wardens will be checking it out, just making sure that it's maintained properly. And if they feel that people aren't appropriate to be staying for any particular time on this part of the riverbank and not just passing through, they'll be asked to move on and said to contact them next time, any time in the future. Uh, gave them, give them a reference that I'd been given and it should be okay for me to stay here and pitch again. Which is totally fine with me if it means it protects and looks after and keeps the maintenance of how these outdoor nature places should be. Considering there's also wildlife to consider as well. So uh, all good in the hood. But I've mentioned it 
sort of in the recent past that um, you know people might have the best will and good intentions but they need to get clued up on the riverways many people maybe out for the first time or not that experienced don't know that there is a highway code so from now on the notification I've been given and quite rightly and legally by the custodians and wardens so now that's been verified so if anything happens in the future where I return here all I've got to do is contact, make a verification, and uh, I can do it again. But they're being very strict with it as to who they're allowing to either stay overnight or have certain projects, that sort of thing. Anyways, now it's time to make up some breakfast on this lovely, lovely, sunny Sunday morning. Kit being repacked into the old school 100 litre dry sack. Softy jacket, softy trousers, sleeping bag, sleeveless body warmer, which I've sort of compacted up into that smaller bag. This has actually been compacted down to a smaller size, so if you're a little bit limited for space, you can compact it down, but I'm going to expand it because it's not the right shape and size proportion to how I want it to fit in the base of the bag. But what else goes in it is the mat, also the multi-pocket SAS style smock, my hood and then there was some clean change of clothes there, some underwear, some gloves. Uh, this clean t-shirt that I put on after this one got sweaty yesterday was in there. That will go in the dry sack as well. So all the stuff that was based, or should I say in the base of the bag, because it's least needed until the end of the day, is actually going to go back in reverse. Just a quick aside about this little thermal mat that went underneath this inflated one. Uh, you've probably seen these before, it's got like a foamy, plasticised, slight insulation underneath and the foil on the top. There's lots of discussion as to whether the foil should be underneath or on the top. I've got personal views on that which I'm not going to get into now, but uh, maybe more about that another time. So that was the sleep base. Final note, you can see how I've expanded that so it'll actually create the right proportion to start the base in the dry bag. And to extend the info, if you imagine the sleeping bag is there, then next to it, this side, is the softy jacket, and then there's a little bit of short space, which then the softy trousers, so it's sort of an equal panel there and there, then everything else will be stacked on top. So I've refolded the smock so I can fold it into three, so it's two folds, one, then that, and then that is proportionate to go on top, so everything is sort of parallel on either side so everything's proportionate in the bag so it's just nice and tidy and fits into the canoe nice and symmetrically. Oh yeah and I brought my Bushman style hat with me so that when I had to pop out on the canoe on the waters for a little while it just shaded the sun off my face and head but it's got a little zipper thing little compartment in there as long as it's something soft you don't want something knobbly on the top of the crown of your head but that could store something in there as well so that's a hat I haven't used for a long time First aid kit, always put on top of any kit carry so you've got easy access to it. Um, so I'll, I'll put it in the dry bag, whereas on the way here I had it in my other utility rucksack. Job done. So in the little zipper bag is a telescopic sectional basher poles. I did bring the firebox with me, could carry it, so I brought it with me. Fire starters, windshield, that could either use for the firebox or as you saw as a reflector for the fire pit. A uh, little mini mallet. What else have I got? Oh yeah, bungee cords, all the fastenings. And that'll go in there, but I did bring this with me. It's not a bunch of CDs, but it is a CD case, and I'll show you what's in it. It's a second world saw, military person's carry. It's never been used, made in Sheffield, England. I'll do a little bit more of a review and actually using it actually out in the field in a, on a future date but it uncurls and you can see a massive great teeth but from some of the research I've done um, British airmen if they had to parachute and got stuck in the trees they would have this nearby somehow and put two wooden handles through there and actually use it as a hand chainsaw to saw the branches and somehow try and unsnag from the trees so you can there there's it fully loaded really curly but when I actually got it I got it off eBay crumbs about I think about five six years it was all caked up brown rusty couldn't unhinge it was all seized up so I spent about on and off over three days some cure rust oil WD-40 you name it I used it 
and uh, eventually, so I got wire brush on it as well, and now it's all quite usable, very very sharp. But so I'll probably use it out in the field sometime and give you guys a demonstration of um, how you can use it. It's better with uh, one person either side sawing at a slight angle. You can go through logs anything up to sort of maybe nine to ten inches. Uh, and I have used one when I went out of the camp with some of the lads oh, a good few years ago. That gave me the idea to get it. And also got my son one as well for his log burner, woods burning stove in case his chainsaw packs up. So obviously always having a manual backup if need be. Um, so that's a bit of a pride and joy. So I don't think it's ever been used. Brand new. Uh, not brand new, but obviously never been used. Issued, obviously. Made in Sheffield, England. And they've got quite legendary status to them. But um, I'll refer back to them in a future video. And all of this shelter kit and everything you can see here is going to go in this bag. Again, I fixed this before. It's sort of like waxed, really heavy duty. Dutch Army issue for one of their really thick sleeping mats to go in. So again, I got this off eBay. I think it was about, I don't know, about a fiver plus about 150 postage. I've had this for about seven, eight years. And I normally use that, as you would have seen before in my previous channel, uh, Travels. So that's had a lot of use and it's really hard wearing and it's really taken a lot of welly and it really serves its purpose. So what have we got here? Well, I think it was a cosmetics bag with a gift I got, oh, I think about 15, 20 years ago. Little, it's a bicycle lamp, rear lamp, but I put it on the front uh, crossbar of the paddles if I'm night paddling because you always have a red light the direction you're going. And then that's the battery charger, uh, sorry, sort of battery power for to charge up the phone because I did a lot of social media stuff and also recorded some stuff on my phone. So I had to sort of charge it up a couple of times torch, head torch, tripod for the phone if I'm doing some long distance camera work and also tripod to screw on my video camera that I'm holding at the moment and all that goes in. Tripod and clamp, you can clamp instead of holding uh, a rod tripod and carrying that you can clamp it to a tree or any upright that's static and also it can unfold and that screw thread can go down so that's one of the legs and then these little tripod sticks so it's a three-legged tripod with a camera mounted on top, so that's quite a useful little gizmo. And then with all the items in that little pouch, that goes in that side pocket. And then on this side, it's just sort of a um, little utility pouch. Hexi stove, always carry that as well, you know. Multi-tool, Millbank bag, and also underneath there is my little EDC strap that I can put on my belt, which has got a can opener, fire steel, little torch, and a lighter. So that's in that little pouch. Old school style from the old days. Our uh, main section of the rucksack, saucepan on the base there, biscuit box, also the hammock I didn't use, so that's sort of one part of the surface, then that food bag, what's left of it, will go on top, and then any other bits and pieces that I've got left over, and that'll be the bag. Have those on top, so if I want to freshen up once I get back to putting a bit of book reading, that can be a surface as well. So we're ready to go, nearly there. Blinking dinking, it's bullet points galore here at the end of this video. I've got one of those little sachets that come with the uh, rat packs and that's a tutti fruity I think it is, mix that with some fresh water, that is drinkable. Didn't have to filter it or anything, I've just got that for backup as well, but just that's my drinking bottle for easy access. If I've got that fresh up, hydrate for when I go back. Easy, lightweight, pack away waterproofs, rectangular bag trousers, cylindrical bag, jacket with hood. General kit bag and sunries. Job done. Ease of access. Normally have a Mora 510 with a few adaptions to it, a bit of power cord, a bit of gaffer tape, a bit of ranger band. And I normally always attach this to any kit bag whenever I'm out canoeing. A couple of shoulder straps, not that padded, but serves a purpose and a waist belt. So I can carry that on your back, or I normally tend to when I'm hoisting it, if not just handling it. I just loosen one of these straps and just stick it over one shoulder. Okay, so as far as my transit trolley, to put the canoe on and then I can stack up bits and bobs and wheel it with this old, again, I featured this before as well, I've had this around, blimey, I think about six, seven years. Found it in an old car park, discarded, it's part of an old, um, or a big sort of DIY barbecue. So I fasten that to that, then obviously that's a platform to wheel anything, but I didn't actually have to use it where I put in the canoe to get here due to the fact that where I parked safely was right next to the, not far from the bank. So for what it was worth, I just went from the boot of the car and one of the passenger seats just 
went back about four times, loaded all the stuff on the bank, and then of course went into the canoe. But the reason I brought it with me, knowing that obviously I'm gonna repeat that in reverse when I go back, is that if there was a problem, if I got stuck uh, for any particular reason, then at least um, I've got the trolley to be able to move this stuff anyway, and I can carry it, uh, on the, load it onto the canoe, so uh, it's worth bringing anyway. And then if I did need to move some stuff, say I'd got on a particular terrain where I carried the canoe, but then it was to wheel some of the stuff to a pitch that I wasn't expecting or planning to go to, then obviously it's um, versatile for that as well. Got the space, got the load carry, so I can bring it with me. Got this kit carry bag. It's got two shoulder straps on it if you wanted to. It's mainly really for a um, paddleboard but it actually came with the canoe that I'm using this weekend and obviously it's not big enough, but it is really handy. I use it all the time to put the paddles in. So when I'm actually transporting in the car, the paddles will go in here, the canoe seat, the canoe bridging support that goes underneath it to raise the level that you sit in. So paddles, basher poles, anything that's long, the fold up seat, any other little sundries will actually go in there. But then of course, once it's unpacked and then there's only things that will go back in the canoe this will only be partially loaded until I'm ready to load it up to put back in the car. So that's another bag. Fold up table, stick table, you saw that. <laughs> and I'm just going to give you a demonstration of all the rubbish that I use. Okay, so in there, no, I'm joking. <laughs> when the fin's disconnected and I'm not using it, that goes down the side pocket of the canoe rucksack. And also there's an old cotton t-shirt with the sleeves cut off. I use as a white rag when the canoe's wet and then this side in this pouch there's a repair kit but you notice the way that I sort of stacked it I've got the flat things at the back and if you imagine that where my foot is here is like the insert of the canoe at the stern behind my backrest of the seat that will sort of fit in this curved area will sort of fit in the insert then that will be flat for everything else to stack on top so it's a specific shape the way I've actually loaded the stuff in there Weight is equally distributed as possible. So there's a little bit more weight on the front than the back, so of course the seat is slightly off centre backwards towards the stern. So it's a nice even keel. So now my pitch is clear. LNT leave no trace. So if weather grounds compacted, but that will soon brush up with a little bit of change of weather. That was already there, that fire pit. And that was a very small fire pit that I then re-dug because I always like shallow fire pits rather than being on the surface. And just left a mark on it so that the custodian warden, when he comes back, he's not going to sort of check me out. There's no real big disciplinary over it. But considering now on this part of the riverbank you need permission, and I've got that, so all I've got to do is confirm beforehand, so that's good because I've verified some of the reasons why I would be here. So the sun is out, the breeze will be coming towards me a little bit, I'll be going upstream. So grateful for using this space. So as I said at the beginning of this video, here and I included the leisure part with the food, variety of food, you know, we've got to eat. If you want just your pot noodles and simple little things, then fine. But if you like being a bit creative, obviously I wasn't fresh cooking over, fresh food over an open fire this time, but it was horses for courses for the practicalities of why I was out for these three days. So, and again, with a few bullet points of loading the canoe. Some of those aspects, as I say, I've featured before, maybe slightly different variants, different versions. But for any new subscribers, I know there have been since sort of summer last year that might not have seen some of the earlier videos. And reminders, a little bit of revision for those of you that might be getting into canoeing or have already been doing it, but need a bit more experience as far as, you know, getting some of the ideas of what I do. Uh, then I hope it's been really helpful. And finish off, as I always do at the end of each video, saying, Thanks for your interest, I really appreciate it. And uh, catch you in another video soon. Cheers, take care.